2009, parents and family, faculty and trustees. It's an honor to be asked here back to Scripps today, this college where I learned so much about myself and life and the world. This place is very meaningful for me, not just because of my own history, but for what it continues to do for hundreds of women every year, this exceptional class that's sitting here before me where Mike's class sat 16 years ago, and for, for all the women who came before and for all the women who will follow us. It always seems strange in life to return to a place where so many things began. I vividly remember my graduation day right here on Elm Tree Lawn. The morning was filled with friends and family, photographs and flowers, parking tickets still to be paid, and yes, some patching to do in my dorm room. I do confess that toothpaste wasn't used exclusively on my teeth that morning. <laughs> that afternoon, my next chapter of my life began as I drove off in my old Ford pickup truck, headed back to Arizona with a 1946 German motorcycle loaded into the bed. Yes, I had received a Fulbright scholarship to study the old colony Mennonites in Chihuahua, Mexico, but a couple of months earlier, I had an epiphany. I wanted to become a farmer. And so I decided the very next day, I was enrolled in economics courses at the University of Arizona, just precisely the right coursework that I would need so I could solve world hunger. Seven decades ago, a woman named Ellen Browning Scripps, whom we will never know, had in mind exactly that kind of lunacy when she founded our college in 1926. Scripps, you see, is not just a place, but it's an idea. The paramount obligation of a college is to develop in its students the ability to think clearly and independently, and the ability to live confidently, courageously, and hopefully. Many things have changed since I first received my Scripps degree, but what Scripps taught me about life and how I should live it has not changed. While writing this speech, I reflected on my last week in the United States Congress. As the first woman to chair the House Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, just last Saturday, I was at the Hubble launch, where I saw a crew of highly trained astronauts blast off into space to perform necessary fixes on our Hubble telescope. Wednesday night was a late one. I was out until 2 a.m. observing a Navy SEAL hostage rescue exercise in order to learn more about piracy. Questioning our Secretary of Defense and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff happened on Thursday. I was questioning what the DOD was going to do to deal with our fighter gap shortfall. And if I look a little sunburned today, it's because just yesterday I participated in the reburial of the Tucson Civil War soldiers by escorting the remains over three hour long on a ride with 200 freedom loving, leather and patch wearing, Harley Davidson riding, VFW motorcyclists. And yes, I wore some sunscreen, but it's very hot that day, just like it is today. Another highlight from last week was when I finally had a chance to meet our incredible Scripps president, along with his wife Mary, and of course the chairman of the board of trustees, Roxanne. We were gathered at this just exquisite black tie dinner to, to see a Scripps graduate, Ruth Owades, being awarded the Fulbright Lifetime Achievement Award. So it's funny to think that a woman born in the 1800s would have created something that prepared me years later for all of these different types of activities. It's remarkable that our Scripps founder, herself an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, understood fundamentally the challenges and the splendor that life affords us. She created this wonderful college for exactly that purpose, a place, a place to think and to grow and to learn, a place to explore, a foundation that we can return to time and time again for inspiration. Graduates, I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't remember a lot about my commencement speakers, whether it was high school or Scripps, or whether it was Cornell University. Although if my speakers perhaps would have put telescopes, pirates, and bikers in the same paragraph, surely I would have remembered that. <laughs> so let me tell you now something that is totally obvious that you won't forget, that today you are at the termination point of one of the best educations that this country has to offer. You have spent a few glorious years receiving enormous gifts of knowledge and discipline. In my case, I learned what an existentialist was and why I didn't want to become one. <laughs> in astronomy, I learned about black holes. They totally freaked me out. And if you saw the recent Star Trek, you'll realize they still freak us out today. 
And I learned after not caring for math in high school to become passionate about calculus. I learned about war for the first time, staying up late at night listening to the coverage of Operation Desert Storm and witnessing student rallies and peace demonstrations. I learned about natural disasters and a community's response due to the earthquakes here in California in the early 1990s. Some of these lessons were part of the school's curriculum and some were not. But all of these lessons were gifts. And with great gifts come great expectations. We are here today, your professors, your parents, your friends. We all expect you to go out into the world to be restless and creative and inspiring with all that you've been given. But there's something else, something more important than that, a responsibility for women today. Something that, with all my research, I couldn't believe that Ellen Browning Scripps ever actually talked about, probably because at her time she was just up to her ears fighting for basic women's rights in our country. But I know if she were with us today that she would mention it. She would want and expect for all of you women the thing that is most elusive, and that is to be happy to find contentment in this life that we have that is far too fleeting. It may be that you will find this gift of your life in pursuit of scientific discovery, or creating great works of art, or growing our nation's economy, or bringing relief to the world's poor. It may be that you will find the calling inside of your heart and the creation of a loving family. But whatever that calling is for you, I urge you to ignore the voices who are telling you what you ought to do with your career and your family choices because you could not authentically live anyone's life but your own. That is the deal that life gives us. We as women have fought for too hard and for too long against the narrowing confines of social expectation to have anything else. Here at this wonderful point in your lives today, this hatching into your future, it is now time to embrace that which was denied for those who came before us. It is now time to follow the passion inside your heart and listen to its voice above all others. And what that voice says to you in the years to come may surprise you. It may invert the notions of what you thought about life and how you thought things would turn out. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with being confounded by this, especially in your early 20s. In fact, I guess I would argue that most of us here in the audience today are still confounded. That is part of the adventure of growing older, of growing deeper into your own skin as women, or as the wonderful woman poem goes, Warning, when I'm an old woman, I shall wear purple. So yes, I'm saying that being happy is something more than just a, something to hope for. It's actually something to expect. When you do this, when you tune out that critical voice in your head and embrace what your heart is saying, you don't just make your life better. You actually make the world better. Let me give you an example. One of the most powerful transformations happened in my life when I was about to leave graduate school. I'd worked hard for my degree in regional planning from Cornell University, and I'd been offered a high-paying high job in New York City. This was a top-eight accounting firm. It was the beginning of a grand and glittery adventure in the big city, posh apartments, pointy-toed shoes, and perhaps, yes, my first martini. But then an unexpected phone call came from my father. He needed me to come home to help him manage my family's tire and automotive company. See, my parents are here today. They say the only time they ever get to see me is when I give speeches, but that's not true. <laughs> this call, as you can imagine, is completely unexpected and not at all part of my cosmopolitan plans. But there always comes a point in our lives when our role as a child begins to reverse with our parents. Our protectors now need protection. For some of us, for us it comes when we are established in life, and for others it may come when we are young. But whenever that call comes, we respond. In my case, it meant packing up those heels, putting back on those cowboy boots, getting back in that same old Ford pickup truck, and heading out west. Like my microeconomics course years earlier, I started out the first morning back in Tucson, but this time out in a tire shop, learning the business from guys named Frank and Chewy, learning the business from the ground up, and starting to give back to the community in philanthropic ways. I started to see some things in southern Arizona that were not perfect and needed change. So I ran for office determined to make that change and put things right and to give a voice to those who didn't have a voice. And then I realized what my heart was saying to me. The highest calling in my own life is service to others. And I have never looked back. 
When that moment of realization dawns on you, as it eventually will, in his own unique message, I encourage you also to seize it and not to look back. Do not focus your energies on making a living. That will come, I promise you. It will come almost as an accident, as a byproduct, without you even having to think about it. Because you are blessed to be living in a country that gives its citizens the freedom to bump around a little bit, to try new things, to make mistakes, to stretch your talents and make adjustments, and to find every rich and satisfying thing. And in the end, I promise you, it will be okay. Remember what the authors of the Declaration of Independence said about the inalienable rights of each person, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think of that. These are words that are some of the deepest expression of who we are as Americans. This is the mission statement of the United States. And I urge you all to make it your mission statement as well. <laughs> Pursue your passion, and everything else will fall into place. And I'm not just being romantic. This is the highest form of pragmatism. Because you should do what you were put here on this earth to do. That is most certain the key to happiness and to success. Some of the most miserable people I've me ever met, both in and outside of politics, have been the people who have chosen their career based on salary and prestige. They have focused on the externalities at the expense of what truly makes them happy inside. And this is exactly the wrong way to go about making a life for yourself. It leaves you empty and thirsty. And it does no good for those who are around you and those in your community. Because material things never satisfy in the long run. So find what it is that you love and pursue it with courage and with confidence. All of the great writers and musicians and scientists throughout the course of time had to understand this before they could make their mark. Nobody ever made a breakthrough creating bland and safe repetitions of what others had done before them. No, the material that is truly revolutionary and pathbreaking always comes from the strange and unconventional and within the subconscious. This is a profoundly individual act, and it takes great courage to take a gamble on what may seem counterintuitive and a little bit odd to those who are around you. Let me say a little bit more about the courage to follow your heart. You have spent several years here learning how to speak a foreign language, or to solve for X, or maybe the right spot to place a penalty kick, and the balanced number of remaining days. But more importantly, you have also been required to take a core curriculum in interdisciplinary humanities, where you've been challenged with readings and lectures and yes, late night discussions about culture and knowledge and representation. What Scripps did was force you to grapple with the peeling back of the human onion in order to discover the supreme value of the soul and how crucial it is to maintain personal integrity and honesty. I can assure you these aren't just some sort of abstract concepts meant only to apply to the rich and the powerful or the fictional. These apply to every single person here, every person on the planet, and they will surely apply in very real ways before too long. There will be many, many times in the course of your professional and personal lives where you will be encouraged in shockingly plain ways to take the easy way, to go along with a group in contradiction of your beliefs. You will be standing one day in the shoes of Faust, most likely somewhere on one of the jobs that you take. But the safety of the world depends on your ability to say no to inhumane ideas. Standing up for one's own integrity makes you no friends. It is costly. Yet defiance of the mob and the service of what is right is one of the highest expectations of courage that I know. A supreme value of education is the understanding that the group consensus is not always right. In fact, it can be totally wrong and must be subject to thoughtful challenge and to questioning. So it is my hope that this graduating class, that you will be among those self-assured enough to make personal sacrifices for what you know is right. So be passionate, be courageous, and be strong. If you remember these things, you will make me proud of you. You will make your parents proud, you'll make Scripps proud, and you'll make the United States proud of you for all of the unique treasures that you will give to it. Thank you. <laughs>